How about that? That's better? Well, you mean it was on all the time I was singing? You poor folks. <laughs> We're all saddened this week because of the events of the week in the news. Uh, I've been a little bit distressed by the fact that only one news uh, man this morning even got close to the problem that we have. I was expecting the rabbi earlier this morning to speak to the words of Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 17, 10, 9, which says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then verse 10 says, I, the Lord, know the heart. I try the reins. Who can know the evil that's in the heart of man? And we look all over the world and we see it manifesting itself where places we don't expect it. And I'm sure that most people in Pittsburgh did not expect it yesterday. It took everyone by surprise. We just came off a week of trying to find the perpetrator of the sending of bombs to politicians and, and public officials. What's the purpose? The purpose is to follow the lead of our spiritual enemy. Because you see, when Adam disobeyed God by one man sin came into the world and death by sin and so death has passed upon all men because that all have sinned and that's why we're here this morning we're here because we believe that sin is universal in the hearts of mankind And we need supernatural, spiritual help to deal with it. And we come to look in God's Word to see what He has done for us and done to us so that we can indeed control this evil that is within our hearts. Uh, I like to read the statements of some of our historical statesmen, presidents. I recall the words of Jimmy Carter a number of years ago when he was president. He said, we have to be careful not to dehumanize our enemies or those who make us their enemies because we're not supposed to have any ourselves. We're to love our enemies, be kind to them, that's tough to do sometimes. Very tough. But not, let's not dehumanize them because he said when we dehumanize them, we put them beyond the grace of God. And that's why I pray for our police officers and our soldiers. I've seen police officers get pretty angry. <laughs> one of them was pretty angry with me one time. It was a child's thing. It wasn't... Uh, and he kind of scolded me a little bit, but he didn't give me a ticket. Now, I don't know if his anger was to uh, just kind of make an impression on me, but he did, whether he intended to or not. I'll tell you what I was doing. I was turning the key off and then turning it back on so it would backfire near kids in town, see, in the car. It wasn't my car, it was my mother's car. And so these two officers gave me uh, an interrogation about that whole thing. Does your mother know you're doing this? They said, are you having engine trouble? This is when I said, no, sir. Well, you turn the key off and turn it back on again. Don't you guy, young guys try this. It's, it's bad on mufflers. But you see, they need to be sometimes. And then I pray for our soldiers as well because it's difficult not to dehumanize the enemy. And we've all heard the statements and the names that are applied to the enemy. We ask them to do an impossible job. But I thank the God 
that it's Jesus Christ who can change the heart, can change the heart of an angry police officer who may step over the line on the law. Not very often. They're pretty good, and I thank God for them. Our soldiers who sometimes step over the line, we all remember Miley, the horrific things that happen in war are beyond the imagination of those of us who have not been in it. Oh yeah, I've been threatened with gunfire, I've been threatened with assault, but never was I in a position of war, which can be totally terrifying. But as Christians, we have a responsibility to reflect the nature of Jesus Christ. And I did hear a little bit of that this morning on the news, but it was one of the fellows on Fox News, I can't remember if it was Pete, Pete Hegseth or not, he said that we have to face the fact that evil is with us all, all over the world. And he's the one that came the closest to the real nature the sin that is in the heart of the individual and the deceitfulness of our heart. And that's our thinker, not our thumper. You know, this, this thumper down here doesn't make decisions, but this thinker does. Now, the message that I have prepared for today didn't have to do with this kind of stuff, but it does fit together. Let's turn together, please, to the first chapter of Ephesians going to do a sequel on what we started with two weeks ago. Ephesians chapter 1, a letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. And we did a little rehearsing of chapter 19 of the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul and his missionary accomplices went to the city of Ephesus. He was spoken in the synagogue and they kicked him out of there. So he spent some more time and several years preaching and teaching in the school of one Tyrannus. And we don't know a whole lot about that school. Apparently, it was part of the uh, societal uh, place where people got together and debated, sort of like town square or coffee shop, only a little bit bigger. And it was a school where things were compared and argued. And he would go there and he presented the fact that Jesus was indeed God in the flesh, come to this earth to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and that is change our heart so we can be acceptable in the presence of God. Because as sinners, we're not fit to go to heaven. Now that might upset some of you, but I've talked to people who think they're pretty good. But the fact is, I don't care how good we are, I used to be bad. Just because I'm not bad now doesn't mean I wasn't. See, I, I'm not, the law can't make me righteous. The commandments, I can keep all the Ten Commandments word for word as they're listed. Now I said I can, but I can't. But if I could keep all of the Ten Commandments word for word, that wouldn't make me righteous because I'm already unrighteous. All it does is prove to me that I'm unrighteous because they speak to the heart. Remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, Master, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the commandments. He said, which one? And Jesus rehearsed a bunch of them. And uh, he said, all these I've kept from my youth up. And Jesus said, you lack one. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. And the man went away sorrowful and Jesus didn't say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, I was just kidding. No, he let him go. He wasn't a success-oriented evangelist, I guess. Because you see, he put a finger right on, this man went away sorrowful for he had much riches, many riches. And Jesus said, that's the last one we didn't name. Covetousness. 
he had a lot of good stuff. He had wealth, position, and he went away sorrowful because he wasn't ready to give that up to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Now, Ephesus was one of those cities where there was a lot of wickedness, a lot of licentiousness, there was idolatry, and all the practices that go with idolatry. And I find it interesting that in the Bible many times there are two big nasty public sins that seem to go together in tandem. Idolatry and fornication or sexual uncleanness of any kind. Fornication comes from the Greek word that's translated uh, pornea. We know what that's a root of. Well, that was Ephesus. Idolatry and fornication. Idolatry and sexual uncleanness. The gospel of Jesus Christ confront, confronts those things. The gospel of Jesus Christ confronts culture. But the good news is, when it confronts culture, it first of all confronts it in the heart of the hearer. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. The Word of God speaks to our heart, and the Spirit of God convicts us of the sin that's in our heart. And remember, our thinker, not our thumper. That's a term that is used for the center of the emotion. And so since sin is confronted by the Word of God, since culture is confronted by the scriptures, and those of us who have believed the scriptures and take God seriously, we repel from sin, or at least we are supposed to. And that's the challenge here. Why? Well, because God has done so many wonderful things for us. Number one, he's forgiven us of all our trespasses. He has wiped out all the unrighteousness of my past. He has made us righteous because God laid upon Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, the sin for us. He became sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God in him. The great transfer, if you please. This is found in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.21 specifically, it capsulizes it. God laid on Jesus Christ who knew no sin, our sin, that's why he died. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then we receive by faith in the person of Jesus Christ, his righteousness, that makes us fit for heaven. That makes us fit for heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, it reads that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And I point out that since Jesus Christ paid for our sins, and the first letter of John the Apostle says, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is the propitiation, the mercy seat, the peacemaker between God and man. And since he has done this, he has dropped the charges, not just for your sins and mine, those of us who believe, but also for those who are still unbelievers. The wickedness of all these people the thing that prevents them from spending eternity with Christ is their rejection of Jesus Christ. And that's a sad, sad thing. Because God's mercy and his grace is available to all of us. So he's dropped all the charges. He has forgiven us our trespasses. He has provided for us a home in heaven. And he has promised the resurrection from the dead. The grave will no longer have control over those who trust in Jesus Christ. Because he rose from the dead. And since he rose from the dead, 
it's guaranteed that all those who believe him and trust him are going to be in the resurrection. This is the redemption of the body. The redeeming of the body. Why is that necessary? I thought, well, we're in heaven with Jesus. And the rabbi was saying this. We asked the rabbi in Talmud class, uh, do the Jews believe in a bodily resurrection? He said, no, it's not necessary. And then we were reading some Hebrew prayers in one of our exercises in Hebrew class. And, and he said, oh, this is very interesting. These very words require a bodily resurrection. Well, the New Testament explains all that. You see, well, Isaiah 53 talks about by his stripes we are healed. And there are people who believe that we can demand healing now. But the healing of the body, the healing that comes to the body, comes in the resurrection when we're made perfect. You see, all healing now is temporary. I had a biopsy done on this finger a week and a half ago. And I go back to the dermatologist, and he'll probably take another big chunk out of it. So my finger's going to be sore for two, you know, another two weeks. Uh, it's all temporary. Well, I don't know what I got. Whether I got a jagger in there or whatever. But it's all temporary. I had Lyme disease. I'm over it now. They finally figured out how to treat it. And I feel a lot better in some ways. But as soon as I get feeling better on one area, something else comes along. That happens with the numbers, guys and gals, you know. The older you get, that's just the way it is. If this shoulder isn't hurting, this knee is. <laughs> when you get this knee fixed, then the other knee complains. He said, I'm not getting enough attention. You know, it's just the way it is. But we have the promise of resurrection, the redemption of the body. Now, God keeps his promises, always has. The devil has never kept one. That's why he, it's futile to listen to him. The devil has broken every promise he ever made. Oh, he should not surely die. <laughs> Boy, is that ever a big lie. Jesus tagged him in John chapter 8 and verse 44. He is a murderer and a liar from the beginning, and he's the father of it. Jesus said that. I'm going to stick with Jesus. Now, let's come to the, the first chapter of Ephesians after that long introduction. You get two sermons this morning. We're going to start at reading at verse 11. Verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestinated according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I want to stop right there about halfway through and, and discuss this issue of being chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Being predestined. You see, predestined is deciding ahead of time what's going to happen. It was predestined by God. God decided ahead of time before he even created the world that he was going to have a nation of Israel and he was going to have a church. Those who were members of the nation of Israel were elect and chosen. They were born Jews. They were raised Jews. They practiced Judaism. Now, there were some who didn't believe, and they departed from Judaism. They were not part of the elect. They did not stay with the corporate election of the nation of Israel. The church, and we're going to see, is the body of Christ. And therefore, everyone who is in the church, and that's every believer from anywhere in the world, redeemed out of any culture, any society. There is no difference in Christ. Being male does not give us an advantage over female and vice versa when it comes to salvation in Christ. 
being bond or free, being Jew or Greek, no matter what, faith in Jesus Christ equalizes all of us in the presence of God. He's given us different roles and different gifts. Therefore, we shouldn't be all worked up over that. But that's off the subject right now. Being chosen in him before the foundation of the world is he decided ahead of time that everyone who believes Christ will be the elect members of the church, his body, and we're going to see in chapter 2 that it's his building. In chapter 5, the apostle says, I show you a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, and he's discussing the relationship in a marriage. I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then, of course, in the final chapter, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places or in the heavenly places, if you please. Every time we pray, we travel through enemy territory because we read in the scripture that Satan is a prince in the power of the air. He is the God who works in darkness in this world. He is God's enemy. He's our enemy. He's the enemy of every human being. This is why he would kill us all if he was allowed. Wow. That God has chosen us in the body of Christ, in the church, to be his elect, if you please. Now, he didn't decide that I would believe because many people have had all the opportunities that I've had and they don't believe. And I've met some. I've had guys, I had a guy, I, I go up to the sportsman's club in Bellwood just so I can mingle with people who don't go to church most of the time. Uh, you know, you hang out with Christians and you get a, a warped view of whole. No, 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 not a bad one, but you get a, you get a narrow-minded view. When I was in Ukraine, I was hanging out with Christians all the time, and they were great. They were wonderful people, but you get out on the street and try to get on and off the subway, it's a whole different story. In Germany, it's just as bad. But anyway, <clears throat> when we have this warp view, I decided to go hang out with some guys up at the sportsman's club. Use bad language, too, sometimes. And this one fellow came to me because it was about 10 minutes after I got my membership, everybody knew I was a preacher. I don't know how they figured that all out. I didn't tell anybody. It's just that, you know, they just happened to know that. And this one fellow said to me, he said, John, I was raised a Baptist all my life. And he said, I can't get it from here to here. I just can't do it. I started to explain it and drew a crowd because about three four guys showed up and uh, the phone rang and that was the end of the sermon but he was telling me I had it shoved down my throat all my life and I can't take any more I usually have a smart remark well you probably didn't get enough because it didn't take I had it shoved down my throat all my life. I told you before, my mother read the Bible to us when we were kids. We didn't go to church. We lived out in Sinkin Valley. We didn't have any clothes. That's what mom said anyhow. We didn't have church kind of clothes. And we didn't have nice shoes. So we didn't go to church until I was about 11. And we started going to Sunday school when my sister got a driver's license and was able to drive. So mom and dad stayed home and my sister drove us to church, Sunday school. So I, I learned a bit. And I was there, I, I didn't really think it was that great and sometimes I didn't like the kids I was in Sunday school with and sometimes I was, was hoping to get out of there because we were going fishing that day. Uh, but it took, but lots of people have had all the advantages that I've had. I was born in a home, was a Christian Mom read the Bible to us and Dad enforced it. 
we lived by a code that the rest of the neighborhood didn't. And we started going to church pretty soon. Every time the door was open, we were there. And I committed my life to the Lord's work when I was about 15. Whatever the Lord has for me, wherever, whether I go to the jungles or whether I go to the cities or wherever the Lord wants me, I'll go. Except I don't want to be a pastor. You have to study too much. Well, that's all I've been doing ever since. <laughs> but the Lord takes those who believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I didn't come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance, Jesus said. And we all qualify. Now, that's taken care of. I want to point out two important things here. Number one, it says we are sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. We heard the gospel. We believed the gospel. We are saved as a result of believing the gospel. And then the Holy Spirit comes and seals us. This is a down payment, if you please, a deposit. The King James Version says it's the earnest of our inheritance. Earnest money is a legal term. Earnest money, when you buy a house or when you buy a car or you buy something, you put something on it. We call it a deposit. It's earnest money. Uh, maybe $100, maybe $200. I recall a situation where there was a farm for sale in Sinking Valley. It was 324 acres. And they wanted $300,000 for it. And uh, the people who were talking about it put a $5,000 deposit on it. And then they said, we don't think it's 324 acres. We think it's less than that. Came back and negotiated. And the owner said, I'll tell you, you get your surveyor, survey the farm. If it's less than 324 acres, I'll pay the surveyor. If it's more than 324 acres, you pay the surveyor. No, no, we don't want to do that. We want our money back. It's a tough break. You put that money up, it's mine. Now that's an example of what this, now think of this, this is the ridiculousness of it. If God reneges on his promise to save us, we get to keep the Holy Spirit, legally. See how ridiculous it is to say that I can, by doubting the Lord, I know there are all kinds of scriptures, if we deny him, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself, we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2. If we deny him, he can't deny himself. He abides faithful because we read that his seed remains in us. You see, he gave me a new nature the moment I accepted Christ as Savior. The Holy Spirit came and provides me with a whole new way of looking at things. Everyone who believes is now sealed to the day of redemption. Sealed. Earnest money's been put up. And God always keeps a deal he makes. He has never made a bad deal. And he keeps it. Because it's always a good one. And when he promises to save us based upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you can't doubt that. We can accept that. We may not understand it all, and anybody who says he does is kind of stretching it a bit. I don't understand how it all works. I never could quite figure out how substitutionary sacrifice could take care of the offender. But all through the Old Testament sacrificial system, God is emphasizing it over and over and over again. The sacrifice of Isaac on the mountain. Abraham, take Isaac, your only son, and sacrifice him there to me. And Abraham's ready, and the Lord said, no, now I know your heart. Now, did God ever doubt his heart? He's proving something to Abraham. 
and he's giving him a lesson in substitutionary sacrifice. What happened? Isaac was condemned to death just like you and I. But a substitute took his place. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, was our substitute. I don't fully comprehend how it works, but if God says it works, I'm up to that. I'll take God's word for it. And that's the basis of our salvation. I've got to get out of here. I only have an hour left. Verse 15, Ephesians chapter 1. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your, under, your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. <clears throat> I was fascinated by the title on the synagogue in Pittsburgh, Tree of Life. You know who the Tree of Life is? It's by the river of life in the heavens, in the new heavens. The Tree of Life is the Lord Jesus, and he's all through the Old Testament, and there was that Tree of Life where? In the garden. God did not want us to live forever in a sinful condition. He had a plan. I don't fully understand it all, I believe it. I just don't understand it all. Something else happened, you know. Uh, when I took Hebrew class, we, had, we learned some Hebrew songs, some of their worship songs. And one of the songs, the early song, and they sing this usually at the Friday night service at the beginning of Sabbath after 6 p.m. or sundown. It's to the king who is the king of kings we welcome his angels to observe our worship. Now that's a, a rough English translation of the song, which says, to the king, who is the king of kings, we welcome his angels to our worship. We welcome, and we sang it in Hebrew, and uh, it wouldn't mean a thing if you, had it. in fact, I don't understand all the words either, <laughs> and I'm not going to sing it. But one nice thing about Jewish songs, I like Jewish songs, because you can sing it any way you like. Every rabbi has his own key, and he has his own approach, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not so good, but I always enjoyed uh, singing the Hebrew songs, and they're usually co collages of scripture from the prophets and the Psalms, and the prayers the same way. But Jesus Christ, is the king who is the king of kings and lord of lords and that's how he's going to appear when he returns to this earth in power to destroy those who are imposters who are ruling this earth by default really under the direction of god's enemy the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Ooh. Yeah, we don't like to say that these horrific acts that are caused are caused by demonic activity. And people kind of recoil and cringe at that kind of thing. But demonic activity is more apparent in the United States than we will ever want to believe it. And that doesn't mean I hate America. 
I love America and praise God for the leaders that we have. I quote a president, our second president, John Adams, who said that nations are judged in this life, individuals are judged in the next. You see, nations don't go into the next life. They don't go to heaven. What nation goes to heaven? No place in scripture do we read about a nat nation going to heaven, but individuals do. And that's where we stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive our rewards or lack thereof when we enter into the inheritance reserved in heaven for us all. Now, just to reinforce a couple more scriptures quickly, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and uh, that's in, on page uh, 854 and 855 of your pew Bible. I give you that because I've pastored a lot of Baptist churches and I found out even some of the deacons don't even know how to find certain scriptures. Uh, I, they look in the index, I see deacons looking in the index to find the, the reference. Uh, that's not good. But I read quickly. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Hang on to that verse. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. The testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. Now one more passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's on page 854. I gave you the wrong one, but you were close, 852. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 12 and 13. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. We are in one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Don't always think of water when you think baptism because there are numerous baptisms in the New Testament. We'll talk about that another time. We're finished. The church is the body of Christ. We are part of that. That makes us elect in him, predestined to heaven, to glory. And the challenge then is We'll get to that later on in the book of Ephesians. Let's live like that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence with us today. We've gathered in Jesus' name to honor you. Therefore, we have been blessed. We pray now that as we go from this assembly into other parts of our lives, that you will make us a blessing and teach us how to walk with thee. We thank you for your presence with us, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.